answer questions about Anthos. Um, we have some pretty senior uh, software engineers and product managers up on the stage. Um, just like what was stated before, we want this to be very fluid and interactive, so definitely queue up if you have those live questions. Um, but to start off, I'm going to introduce myself and then we'll go down the line. Um, I'm Robin Brown. I'm in the Professional Services Organization. I'm the Global Practice Lead of Application Development. Um, I sit in Chicago, so it's great to be out here in California and meeting with all of our customers. Um, so how about you guys introduce yourself and then maybe add a song that you think represents uh, Anthos. Okay, me first? Yeah. All right, so hey everyone, I'm Sven. Um, I'm one of the uh, founders of Istio and I also work on Cloud Service Mesh at Google and on Anthos, which Cloud Service Mesh is part of. Um, so I've been at Google actually for like 13 years, worked on a bunch of internal infrastructure. This is kind of our first big push to have an external product, so it's pretty awesome. Um, my, the, the song that I think comes to mind, and I'm not entirely sure why this is, but uh, Thunderstruck by ACDC. Maybe just because that's how I think people feel when they learn about all that Anthos will do for them. Yeah, there you go. Michael. Uh, hello, my name is Michael Rubin. I am a, the dev lead of GKE on-prem, which means like all the engineering bits and pieces uh, are the, the games I get to play with. And I also work a lot in GKE in cloud too. Um, the music, I guess, that makes sense to me is, uh, does anyone know the Squirrel Nut Zippers? Uh, they're just sort of loud, cacophonous music, uh, lots of jazz. And uh, they have a song called The Afterlife. Uh, we have been playing that song a lot. Um, just sort of late nights, occasionally working and beating through the drums and sort of uh, having lots of fun. And uh, the other one I'm going to add in is uh, Tom Petty's got one called Something Good's Coming. I don't know if anyone knows that one. It's not one of his big hits. It's kind of that quiet song that you play when it's late at night and nothing's working and you need to make it work. And uh, it basically brings me a lot of peace and it uh, helps some other people too. Thanks. I'm Dan Cerulli, I'm a product manager. I work on the service mesh technology, so Istio, cloud service mesh, and of course its role in Anthos. I'm gonna start with a prediction uh, that Michael will give two answers to every question. Um, and, and the song that I uh, will go with is a Foo Fighters song called Learn to Fly, because I think people are gonna do that with Anthos. Yeah. Metaphorically speaking, of course. So coming from the field, um, with all of our field implementation, security is a huge uh, concern, and rightfully so. Um, what sort of added benefits does Anthos offer our customers from a security perspective? Um, so I, I can take that from sort of the service communication aspect. Um, Michael can maybe answer on the containerization. So security actually is one of the big focus areas of, of Istio as a whole, and um, sort of by extension, Cloud Service Mesh. So we want to make it really, really simple for people to secure all of their communication, right? Like everything should be encrypted in transit. You shouldn't have to worry about it. Everything should be safe. You should limit your blast radius, right? Like zero trust networks, um, kind of all, all of that realm of just making security something you don't have to worry about anymore that is just taken care of for you. And I think Anthos is really going to provide that. It takes care of a lot of the sort of nitty gritty of making sure all that works, making sure keys are rotated certs are rotated in the right time, that things you know revoke if they need to be, make it all happen the way that it should. Um, and then we actually give you controls on top of that so you can say like, hey, only this thing should be able to talk to that thing, right? Like only this application should talk to this service. And that lets you actually control things in a much better way than you would with you know typical network firewalls, right? Like you don't, you're not saying this IP address is connected to that IP address. You don't have to go mess with IP tables rules. You say, this can talk to that and that's it. And that's how Google has actually been running things for 15 plus years internally, and, and it works really, really well, and I think everyone's gonna really like that. Dan knows me too well. Um, <laughs> we've been working together a while. I have two answers to this. I'm not really sure I like you that much right now. Um, so I kind of bundle security in sort of two categories. There's the whiz-bang, deep understanding security. I think if you take a look at a lot of the day zero exploits, a lot of them were sort of find or addressed by Google. Um, you know, if you want to have fun, check out the work by Michelle Au or uh, Tim Alclair. Uh, a lot of this stuff got featured in LWN, and you can see there's a lot of deep understanding of what's really going on in this new space with containers and security. And what's nice is that with Anthos, when these things are happening, it's really hard to keep track of microservice security and what's going on in that barrier between containers and the OS. We have an integrated solution that we take care of that for the user. 
keeping track of your operating system, your container technology, your Kubernetes, and what happened in the latest release, it's hard. It's very hard to keep on track, and we have that expertise. You don't have to worry about it. The other part is um, kind of more boring part, which is keeping things up to date. It's not easy to do with open source, and staying on top of the latest CVEs, knowing which ones are worthy of upgrade and which ones aren't, is something else that Anthos is about. So we've started and designed it from the beginning to think about upgradability and doing that all the way again down to the stack with the operating system, the host OS, the container OSs, and all the parts of Kubernetes. That's the part that's much more of the grind, but it's the piece that you really want to outsource because you just do. Uh, that's about it. I don't know if we're going to go through everybody. Um, yeah, I hate those panels where <laughs> everyone says how they feel today and then you get bored by the last person. And uh, Dan, you nailed me too much, so I'm going to just go back to Robin. Yeah. Um, or questions from the audience? I don't know. Raise your hand if you're a DevOps person or you work with your CI CD pipeline. Um, we have a few in the crowd. Um, so maybe Dan or Mike. Um, that's a question. Can you talk to kind of the value statement of CIC or some of the benefits uh, that we're incorporating to kind of meet the customer where they're at? So instead of adding overhead burden to CIC, maintaining another CICD pipeline, kind of the incorporation of, into their pre-existing pipeline. So, so I, I gave a talk earlier today. Did anyone attend my talk earlier today? This is, will be, re, this will be <laughs> a refresher for you. But for everybody else, this is, this is new. Um, this customer is not using Anthos yet, but they are using the different components. They're using GKE, they're using Istio. And uh, in the last six months, have migrated about 186 services uh, from an on-prem VM-based cluster to a GKE cluster uh, using Istio. And what's beautiful is that they didn't change their developer experiences at all. They have a very good CI CD pipeline, and they changed the output of that CI CD pipeline, which used to take compile a jar, spin up a VM, and then deploy that jar to the VM. Now instead, their developers still use the same CI CD, but they modified their pipeline so it produces a container and it deploys that container into GKE. And, and the beauty of what they did was that they already, you know, they, they were disciplined enough to already not have developers who were off, you know, SSHing into, into hosts to, to get things involved. They had done some automation. And when they adopted, uh, you know, kind of changed the platform completely underneath it didn't affect their developers. Uh, and, and, and that's been a big deal. They are now multilingual, where they used to, they, they could only handle jars before. Now the developers use the appropriate language for the appropriate tool. Uh, they have better insight than ever into their application and how it's running. But what, what enabled that whole thing was a good, robust CI CD pipeline. Yeah. Um, so we're, what we're hearing a lot from customers across the board is, um, introducing another technology, if you think about the change curve, people, process, and tools, or technology, um, we're offering a new technology, we're offering new processes. What do, what do we do about the people aspect? How does, how does tomorrow look for customers that are adopting this for role change? I mean, yeah. We want to take incoming questions first before we, because we've got a list here, or do you want to? We have no one queued up. We, we, we have a queue? We don't have anyone queued okay. up. Okay. So, like, <laughs> While you're in the audience right now, um, these these two people with red jackets yeah, come. Just to let you know, like them. the people here, like Dan, Sven, myself, we have handled like ugly situations with customers. Maybe not always as well as we want, but we've worked and journeyed with the customer. Please feel free to ask what's on your mind, and you know, I, I don't think we'd have the most successful experience right now if you just hear us tell you, you know, a one-way conversation. If we have anybody with some thoughts or even some humdingers that they think, you know are hard, you know, please feel free. That's fine. That's what we're here for right now. And hopefully, you know, we'll be doing this here. And if you don't want to do it right now, we'll be at the booth later if you want to hit us. Someone's got his hand up. Wonderful. Oh, there we go. Brave soul. Here we go. <laughs> hey, thank you. And uh, I'll start the ball rolling. So we've got a hybrid cloud strategy where I work. Uh, we're just about to start with Google, but we've got Azure, we've got IBM cloud. Tell me a little bit more about how Anthos is going to help me deploy to all three clouds and uh, avoid the fragmentation that kind of goes on if you don't have something like Anthos? Yeah. Sure. So it, it, first off, I think the question that you asked, just to restate it and for people who maybe didn't hear it too, is that um, you have an environment right now that's Azure, IBM, and maybe Google too? You're just about to start Google. How do you keep consistency among these three different environments that have a very different stack? 
So there's no silver bullet to anything, and I'm not going to pretend there is. It depends on where you are in your journey. If you are very container and Kubernetes ready right now, the neat thing about Anthos today is that you can deploy Kubernetes across them and have a consistent interface and API that will be able to abstract out a whole bunch of the components in these environments. I mean, that's one of the big values of Kubernetes, that you can manage your hardware environment and your software environment lifecycle in a consistent way with some YAML as opposed to actually making code changes. Um, what's also nice about what we're doing here with Anthos is that it allows you to, we're providing tools to actually do rollout configuration and other items that are, again, consistent. Like, consistency and choice is really some of the big points behind Anthos. So I encourage everyone, there's this thing we haven't talked about as much, I think, in the keynotes and other areas, Anthos config management, which is basically how do we use Git, leverage that in YAML, to allow you to handle all these environments and resources at different levels, keep it straight, and then deploy it selectively. So I could go and talk about this forever because it's a complicated and complex problem, but if you take a look at the offering, sorry, if you take a look at the offering, you should be able to see that the consistency of the API and the, the goals of making sure that we are abstracting away multi-cloud, you know, our identity story rests quite heavily on OIDC as opposed to, you know, deeply diving into per environment specific APIs is the thrust and the theme behind the technology. Does that answer your question? Okay. For those not seeing it, he's kind of nodding like he bought it, which is good. Do you have something to add? Yeah, I was going to add something. I don't know. So, so this is what I want to say is that today I heard someone on stage say, with Anthos, you can finally, you know, write once and run anywhere. And, you know, any developer says, well, I can write code and run it anywhere today, right? I can take Python. And Python runs the same at Google as it does at Azure as, as it does at IBM, right? The thing is that everything around that running code, how you network to it, how you authenticate, uh, all of that is very different at IBM and in Azure and, and in Google and on your on-prem. And the idea with Anthos is making all of that consistent so that everything around that can be the same no matter whether you're deploying to, to Google or to uh, IBM or Azure or, or Amazon. And, and it's that consistency that, that uh, I think we're helping to give you. I, I was just going to add that I think actually Anthos also can help you with moving things around between your different environments too. So yeah. if, if you, you know, install Anthos in all the environments and it's really easy to you know, spin up something in a different place, see how it performs, route 1%, 10%, whatever amount of traffic to it, you know, compare things, do all, all that kind of stuff. And you can actually seam seamlessly move things around uh, between clouds, between Kubernetes and VMs, right? Wherever you want without anything else um, having to know about it. So that's really useful. I like that one. Um, is there another? I mean, does anyone have yeah. anything on their mind? You know, where Sven got his clothes, that's fine. <laughs> Robin, I know Robin's got more, but uh, I'm sorry, you, sir? Hi there. I just wondered if there was um, any particular CD component that you're proposing uh, as part of that. Can you get closer to the mic? I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Um, yeah, I just wondered if there's any particular CD uh, tool that you're proposing in Anthos. Is it Spinnaker, for instance? Um, oh, what is continuous. Is there a CD yeah. system that's sort of built into yeah. Anthos or, or proposed to use with Anthos? Oh, this is the, the marketplace. Continuous deployment? Yeah. yeah. So the continuous deployment space right now is in a, sort of an interesting transformational pivot point. Um, and it looks like, you know, for the longest time, Jenkins has been what people have been using as an automation structure. And it's kind of like the bash script of being able to handle sequential events. And right now, as people are moving into the cloud, the elastic nature of the cloud and the, the more sophisticated needs of concurrency as we scale is creating this really interesting opportunity, I think, for all the technologies. It's kind of fun to watch. You know, the, the, what got us all here is not going to get us there. And so right now, Google has not, you know, we have our opinionated um, conversations and technologies that we're offering. But at the same point, we do what I think we do well. We're trying to make the space successful. So there's this thing out there that I learned about like a few weeks ago called the the Continuous Delivery Foundation, which is yet another Linux Foundation organization that is supposed to make the open source world look good and you know, have us all work together. And we recently donated something called Tekton to it, which is based, again, upon the same sort of things that we believe will um, allow us to, like I said, take things to the next level, allow us to scale, and allow us to have a, a different API system. So that's a, a good piece of technology to look at right now. But that said, Anthos is very componentizable. 
So it will work with Jenkins. It will work with other solutions. And I don't know if anyone really has a clear winner for the next five years of where the industry and the conversation is going to go. But what's nice about Anthos is you have choice. You have less risk that when you take Anthos, these APIs are flexible enough that you're not locked in. And to me, when I'm building large systems that are going to last a long time, that's what's valuable. So I can sort of hedge my bets a little bit and see where I want to put my cleverness beans. You're smiling. So again, I feel like it's working. <laughs> or not. All right. Can you talk about how you, um, how you connect to Jenkins to the marketplace? I, I how, what? how do you connect Jenkins to the marketplace? I still haven't heard the question. So I heard, how do you connect Jenkins to a platypus? Uh, marketplace. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if I'm right. No, to the marketplace. I, I don't know if our marketplace has APIs that would allow you to do that in an automated fashion. I'm not sure. It does, yeah. Uh, so we have, yeah, uh, we have about, <laughs> we have about uh, 15 or 20 or so apps available in the marketplace. So. Um, Jenkins is one of those things that we're leading with as a premier partner that's available, and we have APIs available through the marketplace. So if you're already a Jenkins customer, uh, you can continue to use Jenkins via marketplace for Anthos. Any other live questions? Live questions. Anyone? I guess they did a really good job in uh, the keynote so well that they told everybody everything they need to know. How many of you are using GKE in production today? Oh, I see. So it's a small number of people. OK. How many of you are using VMs in production today? What did the rest of you use? <laughs> are people using Kubernetes that is not GKE? It's mostly AS400 mainframe developers here. <laughs> That's what I'm learning. There's some Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say, um, how about this? Uh, so I'm engaged with a lot of customers across the globe. Um, and we have, we have kind of like the entire stack. And we're talking about product by product. But if you really think about just like the, the one or two game-changing effects of the entire stack of Anthos, uh, what are things that you would highlight? You want me to go? Yeah. yeah. Each, okay. So we we'll can each... eat, we can do the boring like go now yeah. slide, but it's important. <laughs> so uh, actually, I'll let, I'll let you guys go. I'll, I'll I'll think about it. So so I'll start by by talking a little bit more about that customer who I talked to who talked with today, and they kind of related their their journey to GKE and Istio. And again, they're not on Anthos yet, but they're they're already seeing these benefits. Um, in addition to things like their spending has gone down, their resources consumption has gone down, and, uh, and they have MTLS. They have much better security than they used to. The real benefit to them is that their 350 services, they used to do a total of about, I think they said 400 deployments a year, right? Deployments were a big deal. Um, this, this year right now, they're on pace to do 15,000 deployments. And for them, the difficulty in doing a deployment, you know, many of these teams were deploying quarterly in the past. Um, now they have people who are, they're deploying constantly. And they said that they, their, their fiscal year they're just finishing is 15,000. Next year they think it'll be 30. And so one of the benefits is moving to this, this real microservices based environment. Uh, you can move very quickly. And for them, above all else, that's, that's the biggest thing they're getting out of it. So uh, I'll, it's okay if I go next and then, and then you go. Um, so, I was actually just thinking back to um, something that um, Eric Brewer said in a talk recently when he was talking about Istio. But so one of the things Istio does is it helps you decouple sort of the development tasks from the operation tasks. It might still be the same person doing them, right? But they're, they're very distinct. What the Anth Anthos does for you is take all those operation tasks and help you automate them. So you, you just can focus on the development part, the sort of fun part, at least for me. Um, you, don't have to, you don't have to do as much to do the operations. You don't have to manage all the services and keep them up and give them SLAs and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's the big game changer for me is that, that decoupling and then automation. So the more, that we can, well, the more that we can take away from sort of the things that you don't want to be doing and just automate that, make it all built into the platform, make it easy to control, and let you focus on your business and what you want to do, the better. And that's, I think, a big part of the Anthos story. Businesses now are pretty much in the in a race for software and software iteration. 
So I was surprised. I was talking to a tire company, and they said, we want to be a services company. And I'm like, you sell tires. They go, no, 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 we sell tire services. And what this really means to me is they want their software to iterate and be competitive. Um, software to me is just, it's just imagining things. And what you want in your company is the developers to focus on imagining the things that only are specific to your company, your applications, and the value that you can get out of them to focus on what your company needs to do to, do to be successful. If you have them also spending a lot of their time managing and focusing and developing the infrastructure, I, I find it hard to understand how you're going to be as competitive. And because someone else out there may outsource that or have someone else do that. And you know, this is what we're trying to do to provide for the customer. Um, I, I met this really great person once, a customer who said, I don't want my engineers tinkering with Kubernetes or tinkering with all this infrastructure over and over and over again. We want them to come to you with what needs to be better and then work with you to improve it while they focus on solving our problems. And I think that this sort of partnership is really what Anthos is about. And I know it's a little cliche and a little weird and a little abstract, but it's really where do you want to spend the cleverness beans in your organization? Where do you want to have your focus? And so with Anthos, if you look at the problems it's tackling, configuration management, um, cluster management, application lifecycle, service mesh, you know, how involved do you want to be in the open source um, management of these items? And how much of it do you want to leverage others to shape and focus that work? And we have a live question. Yep. Hey. Uh so how you configure uh, Anthos? I mean, the, by definition, you said it's YAML. And like a, you assume like a, for a real configuration, it will be like a huge YAML file or something like that. I'm curious, like a, probably you have some SDK or something like that to configure it. Well, I, I can talk about Anthos config management. So Anthos has. Re repeat uh, the question real quick. Uh, so yeah. the, the question was, uh, Anthos sounds like there's a lot of configuration is, is, it, is it a big, huge YAML file? Um, and, and in reality, it's worse than that. It's, it's many, many uh, huge YAML files in, in, all, in reality. I, I want to be clear, right? Um, YAML is one, one of the, the great things about Kubernetes is its API. But the, the, the primary interface of that API is, is YAML. Um, when I see very successful implementations, though, they aren't making their developers go, go write that YAML. The, you know, I see, I see very successful implementations where the CI CD pipeline itself can, can uh, take the intent from the developer, which might be a very simple config file, and, and express that in YAML. So in some ways, I think of YAML as the, as the bytecode of, of, the, of the Cloud Native Foundation, right? Um, no one writes bytecode. You write in higher level, higher level languages. And so it may be very well that, that you have a simple config file that says, deploy me in two regions. Right? And deploy me with, with you know, five, five uh, replicas. Um, and that what comes out the other end is some YAML that, that, that goes into, um, that goes into uh, the config management and, and affects that change. One thing that we can do is we can take this, the, the Anthos config management can make sure that your that, that, uh, configuration is consistent across your, you know, if you are running multiple clusters, that it, it can make sure that you have the, the correct policies and the correct YAML, essentially, in the right places. So in, in reality, the, if you think about all the, all the different CRDs that are involved in a, in a Kubernetes implementation, the YAML can be, um, can be daunting. Um, but in, in, a, in a real practical application, you might not need to expose that to your developers. And, and, and that, that sounds kind of outlandish, but, but I know customers with very successful implementations where that's exactly what they did, was they abstracted away the actual YAML itself. I, I do want to add one thing there, which is that the, the APIs for Anthos are just the open source APIs for Kubernetes and Istio and, and the other components. There, there is not a proprietary API here, which means all of your configuration is portable, right? You can spin it all up if you want to run it yourself. Um, and all your, all your applications and configurations will be portable to that. So we, we don't have a proprietary you know, Google developed API that we're using for all this. It's just the open source APIs. There, the, the product Anthos configuration management takes longer to say than to appreciate and probably to use. So there was a, um, uh, a demo yesterday at the multi-cloud session. I encourage you to check it out. In the middle of that demo of how to deploy things across multi-cloud, they had like a 90-second piece where they used Anthos configuration management. 
And it was really straightforward. It was really easy to see how they took the various configuration and then deployed it selectively. And honestly, I, I kind of think that we're talking about it in a way that highlights its importance. But the ease of use with what that team put together is, to me, was surprising. And when I finally saw the demo, I was like, oh, oh, this isn't that big a deal at all. And so it's worth checking out. Um, instead of trying to have us here convince you, uh, take a look at that demo. I know that I talked to the tech lead. There's going to be more um, demos coming out about Anthos config management. And I think it's one of these things that when you see it, it's a lot easier to understand that the problem space doesn't have to be that hard. We have another live question in the back. I don't think it's working. Okay. Can you comment on, um, on just the right path to get started? Right? What's the right way to, to train, to learn, to evaluate? I assume it's not free, so somehow we have to take, right? Our, we have to go from our production Kubernetes environment, introduce, prove it out, and implement it. So maybe just comment on what that path looks like. So I'm really excited to talk about this because I think I, I've had a lot of learning in this area. Um, it's really easy to look at all this open source technology and get excited about just the technology. And I think you leave out two really important ingredients or components of the solution, people, and on top of that, the, the uh, problem you're trying to solve. And what I've learned is that instead of going from the bottom up and saying, what do my VMs look like? What does my Kubernetes look like? What's the footprint I need? I think it helps a lot first to understand that the people you're trying to solve, not just your customers, but your organization, and what the flow of that organization is going to be. I tend to think that what we're doing here, we have app developers, we have cluster administrators or resource administrators, then we have infrastructure administrators, and understand their needs, and then understand the needs and the shape of the applications. And I find that if you don't do that first, if you instead focus on all the whiz -bang, cool, fun toys, you're going to find that you may have built something that feels really good but doesn't really solve your problem. And I think once you do that, once you know the shape of the footprint, what success looks like, what your success metrics look like, not just in the end solution of what you write, but the operating life cycle of what you're doing, I think that helps a lot. And the last thing is what's nice about Anthos, and I think the, the really great thing that Kubernetes helps you with is it embeds the idea of the life cycle of your solution into almost all the APIs. So it's rarely just about provisioning. It's also about managing and then decommissioning and upgrading. And if you understand the problem you're solving, the people you're dealing with, and all the life cycle of them first, I think you'll start finding that the technology pieces almost fall out of that very easily. Um, I don't know if that's uh, more, I can be more specific yeah. if you want. Yeah, so how do you get started with Anthos? I, so I if you want to get started on Anthos, um, go first. So everything that Mike said, you don't have to do alone. Um, Myself, and there are actually a, quite a few of my team members in the crowd. Um, Professional Services has been uh, teaming up with Eng and PM very closely over the last year and a half or so to really understand the technology and frame out like what are, what are the best practices, what are the gotchas, what are the pitfalls. Um, going through everything from the installation of GK on-prem if you want to do an on-prem installation, all the way through the stack, config management, uh, CSM or the service mesh layer. Um, even looking at things like Knative and Cloud Run, your, uh, your entire deployment uh, pipeline also. So we're, we're deeply involved in all of those things. You don't have to do it alone. You can, you can partner with us, and we would be very willing to, to do that journey with you. And bringing up the Kubernetes environment um, has been happening a lot faster than the customers have expected so far. So again, I don't want to make a guarantee or a promise on stage, um, or even not on stage. <laughs> but so far, the customers have been very, very happy with how long it takes from going from the initial environment to actually bringing up a cluster because PSO is trained and the software has been shaped well by people who have been doing this for a while. So getting that cluster up and going first, maybe starting with a stateless workload, and then working from there based on your requirements is probably a good way to get started. And playing with uh, configuration management, I really can't overstate how you understand that and involve it in your workflow early can be helpful. to add, uh, so for those of you that have a team to train, we do have a 
two, we have two Coursera courses that are being uh, made available. So our training team does work with our technical leads to uh, roll out architecting with GKE. For those of you that need GKE experiences, hands-on experiences, and this was have hands-on lab and, and all. Uh, the second piece is architecting hybrid with Enthos. So that will be made available in a couple months. Uh, so you can look out for those uh, Coursera courses. I think we have time for one last live question. Does anyone? Have a live question. There you go. So it, it sounds like what I've heard from. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. So <laughs> what I've heard uh, in the um, keynote was this is a multi-cloud solution, but we're purely in GCP. Is it something that we should be looking at um, if we're going through the whole decomposition effort? And and what does it really give us that we should look at? <laughs> so uh, absolutely yes, right? So this is um, this is about managing your stuff wherever it is. If it all happens to be in GCP already, awesome, thank you. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's going to give you the security. It's going to give you the networking. You know, GKE gives you great container management. The config manager portion of Anthos is still useful if you run you know anything more than one cluster, right? If you have VMs and, and clusters, you should do that. So yeah, absolutely, it's it's useful, even if you're just on GCP. Our our success metric, our success metric, if I can say that quickly, is um, consistency and choice. So if we end up inadvertently doing something that is only going to work in cloud or only going to work on prem, that's something that we feel we need to evolve past. And the idea here is that. It isn't something that you should hopefully have to worry about architecting in over time. And that, that's it. Okay. Um, and I think let's close this out. And then um, before I do that, just uh, to note, all of us will actually be at a booth with a bunch of other Anthos SMEs right behind this red community corner sign. Uh, so if you have other questions that you want to ask one-on-one, -on -one, or if you want to continue the engagement with professional services, or um, something directly with product or engineering, please ask us there. Uh, but just for a closeout, how about one piece of advice moving forward for our, all these customers? Dan, you want to start? Well, I would say that as you, as you look on an implementation, thinking about, think about why you're doing it and, and what your metric of success is. Um, and you know, if, you're, if, you're, if your goal is to do more deployments, it's a great thing to measure, then, then make sure as you go through that implementation that that's the thing you're, you're, you're measuring. And, and you know, know what you're trying to do, go ahead. You don't want to implement the technology just for technology. Understand what it is you're trying to change and, and make sure that, that you're tracking that. Uh, I have to think <laughs> about it too. But, um, so I, I think my, my biggest piece of advice um, would be to, to really think about what you, I, I, sort of what Dan said, but think about what you want to pay for, right? As, as a developer, as a business owner, what, whatever role you have, what parts do you want to pay for and what parts do you want you know, someone else to run for you? Um, and I think Anthos is, is here for the, uh, hopefully most of you that realize that, yeah, you know, I, I don't need to be an expert in running hundreds of thousands of Kubernetes clusters or in managing encryption keys and you know, handling zero day exploits and all that kind of stuff that we can handle for you, right? So, so think about where, where you are providing value and focus on that. This is way too much pressure. Um, one piece of advice, listen, watch. Uh, the community now has gotten quite wide. There are many people that I've noticed that I'm engaging with. They're very rarely have I seen a unique problem set. And so, talk to each other, listen to each other, and talk to us, and listen to us, and realize that right now, I think the world is making a large transition. And as we're moving from one environment of on-prem into cloud, you know, again, I guess I'm in a cliche mood today. Um, we really are all doing it together. And so what I like a lot about multi-cloud is that we are, we are figuring it out all at the same time. And the evidence in the internet and the um, Support is really everywhere. And so that's what we're trying to provide in Anthos, and it's why working with open source can be you know, so game changing. That's it. Thank you. I think just, but, uh, just really quick, um, I, I'm not supposed to add into this, but I'm going to. Um, I work directly with a lot of customers, and um, 
one thing I see is a lot of customers try to boil the ocean. Um, don't do that. Experiment, iterate, uh, focus on maybe like a COE in your companies um, that you can make those changes and adjustments really quickly. And then the other thing um, is be vocal. These are, this is a fraction of the team that's building this product for all of you. If a product is not serving your use case or your business need, be vocal with professional services or your partners or whoever you're working with. And you can really, you can really pave the way of what the product's going to look like in the future. So uh, don't boil the ocean, experiment, iterate fast, and then uh, be vocal.